Hello and welcome back to the virtual classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Olmsted. And we're going to finish up the second half of our lecture on Mexicanos in the Gilded Age today. So let's get started. Now we left off talking about this kind of turmoil and unrest as workers in the East begin to rise up during the Gilded Age, upset over being exploited as workers, as laborers, due to low wages, horrible work conditions, and just general exploitation being treated as replaceable laborers. And we see many begin to turn to strikes and we start seeing the beginnings of a union movement. Now, unfortunately, though, this is where most of US history has focused. But let's take a moment now and take all that stuff, all that background of the Gilded Age, that gold-plated crap, and let's shift away from the oft-studied East Coast and move to the Southwestern mines. Now, mine work was dangerous. Mine work was terrible. And in 1849, when gold was discovered in California, it seemed easy at first to strike it rich, get rich quick. But as we said before, the independent mining is going to soon give way to large corporations who will utilize and need unskilled laborers. Because what happens is, as the surface minerals, valuable materials, are all taken quickly by these panhandlers, it's going to take large amounts of money to purchase equipment and pay people to dig deeper in the earth into these mines to extract the raw resources. And of course, these can, and only the rich can afford to do this. So they've evolved into corporations. And for a worker though, these conditions were terribly dangerous. There was toxic gases. There were cave-ins. There's no regulations. There's long hours, 10, 12 hours a day, low pay, shortened life expectancy, and largely is being used as laborers here in immigrant groups. Now, Mexicanos, which again, could be either Mexican or Mexican-Americans, but other immigrant groups as well, like Chinese, like Japanese, like Chileans, became standard practices in places like California, Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico. And this is not just mining for gold anymore. It's silver, mercury, anthracite, all these valuable materials. So let's take a couple, look at a couple of case studies here. And we'll start in California with the new um, Almaden mine in Santa Clara, California. It is said to be California's oldest mining operation, started in 1845, in part by Mexicans. Remember, this is five years before California's statehood. 1845 is before the Mexican-American War, and so this is largely started by Mexicans themselves. And in the new Almadian mine, they're mining mercury, known as quicksilver because mercury was an important key in the historical process for extracting gold and silver. So what happens is when you extract gold and silver, it's mixed with dirt and sentiment and mud and other ores. And in order to separate the precious material, gold, silver, from the crappy material, ore and dirt and rocks, you used mercury to kind of dissolve and separate the materials to isolate the precious metals. Now, as you can imagine, the work in these mines was very difficult. You, in, you have to imagine here, there often, as you see the picture on the bottom left, this is being, you have to go down into the mine, which means you have to carry stuff up a ladder and out into the open. A Mexican miner would carry a leather backpack loaded with up to 200 pounds of this mercury, also known as cinnabar. And they would have to carry it up a ladder that was notched with redwood timber. So you have a wooden ladder from redwood trees. 
You're carrying a backpack with 200 pounds of rock. And all during the Mexican-American War, this was very much a Mexican miner, you know, owned mine. But after the war's over, Anglos rushed in and took it over, usurped the land, and they would pay dismal wages. These are obviously dangerous work conditions. There are health and safety issues. And eventually, the New Albion Mine becomes a company town where the company owns everything, not only the mine, but all the land surrounding it on which you live. And there were three separate enclaves. There was the English town for the average Anglo person. There was the hacienda for the, the mine owners. And then there was Spanish town, the poorer section, with as many as 1,500 both Mexican, Mexican-American, and Chilean workers and their families. And of course, one of the hallmarks of a company town was you often weren't paid with money. You were often paid with what's called script or credit. And that credit could only be used at the company owned store where they would charge higher prices. And so you're forced to live in the company town in company owned housing. You're forced to buy your products, your food, your, your stuff you need at the company owned store where prices were higher. And you're often paid in this credit, the script that was only good at the store to be used at the higher prices. And so again, you're paid little and then being forced to pay higher prices. This is not good. And so it's no surprise that in the early 1850s, workers, Mexican and Chilean workers, would institute a work stoppage, a strike. Now, this was not a formal large effort like we saw with the Knights of Labor yet, but it was a collective effort at reform. Management will immediately call in law enforcement, police officers. They will bring in scab laborers. Now, scab laborers means non-union laborers or outside laborers. This is often done by employers to help break strikes. And often they're done by immigrants. These scab laborers are often immigrants. And ultimately, the combination of bringing in scab laborers, using the police force to break up the strikers, and then the courts ruled in favor of the companies. In which case, the new Albanian mine will replace the Mexican American workers with Euro immigrants. Basically, they're out of a job now. This strike is a massive failure, just like we saw back east. But this is considered one of the earliest labor actions out west, and it mirrors the patterns of early labor efforts back east. This is California. How about Arizona? One of the largest mining operations in Arizona was the Clifton Morrency Copper Mine in eastern Arizona. It officially starts in 1872, but its origins, the beginnings of it, can again date back to the pre Mexican American War era. However, in 1872, Henry Clifton takes over the mine and it begins official operation of mining copper. This area quickly becomes a magnet for both. Mexicano and Chinese laborers, and we'll see production dramatically increase, which will require even more labor. Now, of course, it started 1872 officially. By 1882, the Chinese have now been excluded. And so after 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act forces the labor force to be almost entirely made up of Mexicanos. By 1890, despite being the ones, Mexicanos that is, who taught the owners of the mine how to mine, they literally taught them how to mine the copper in the region, in the mine. Mexicanos by 1890 are nothing but day laborers, common working class working the lowest rungs of the mine. The Leadership positions are being taken by Anglos, or skilled positions are taken by Anglos. And so by the 1890s, workers are getting fed up. 
And finally, they formed their own union in the area. And there were, this was a joint effort of workers, an inter-ethno-racial group. There was a Mexican man by the name of A. Salcido. There was an Italian by the name of Frank Colombo and a Romanian by the name of W.H. Lasternau. And these men will come together to form a union to represent the workers. Now, in 1903, they go on strike. And in response to that, the state government organizes a group known as the Arizona Rangers. So the miners call in for help. As always, they call the state government. The Arizona legislature passes a law that creates the Arizona Rangers, similar to the Texas Rangers. This is a special group of armed men who are going to patrol the border and in theory to prevent cattle rustling where they steal, steal cattle. However, their most common task used was to break up strikes. However, there was a small partial victory. After pressure from the unions, the state government also would pass an act that would prohibit anything longer than eight hours of working in the mine in one day. And this law particularly impacted the clifton Morency mine, who were hiring Mexican laborers at below market wages. So they're paying Mexicans less money. So on June 1st, 1903, the eight hour workday law went into effect. The mine operators dropped the workday from 10 hours to eight hours. Now, the assumption was though, that workers would still be paid for 10 hours because mine work is excruciatingly hard. So the idea was they'd be paid for 10 hours, but work eight. So otherwise they could not survive or live because they're paid such dismal wages. Now the other option would be to increase their hourly wage so they can make up the difference. But rather than follow the law, the Clifton Morency mine in Arizona instead only paid the workers for nine hours. Now they still paid the white skilled laborers for 10. They only paid the Mexican workers, the low unskilled laborers supposedly, for eight, for nine hours, which means they are losing a whole hour per day of wages. And this severely impacts the Mexican or Mexicano ability to live, to survive. They're already working overtime. I mean, they're already working overkill as far as on their bodies. This is dangerous work. And now they're being paid even less to survive. And so two weeks later, in mid-June 1903, the workers are going to go on strike. And again, they walk out of the mines halting production. And these men did have the support of a national labor union, the Western, Mine, Western Federation of Miners Union. Now, June 5th, they're on strike. So June 1st, the went into effect, the new law. Two days later, Having faced with this decrease in wa daily wages, the workers go on strike, mostly Mexican. And on June 5th, we can read it on the screen, is a newspaper account of what's happening with the strike. It says the strike is now composed almost entirely of Mexicans. Again, we know some are Mexican, some are Mexican-American, but their term, all Mexicans. Quite a number of Americans have left the camp. These men are taking no part with the Mexicans. It seems the Mexicans are being led by one or two prominent leaders. They gather two or three times a day in Morency and listen to speeches from the leaders who are very industrious and have used harsh language concerning the gringos. This morning at five o'clock, more than 200 Mexicans gathered at the mouth of the Humboldt Tunnel, this would be the entrance to the mine, listening to the harangues of, by the leaders and music by the band. This will probably be the end of Mexican labor in the district, unquote. It was not the end of Mexican labor. Instead, immediately after this, 
the governor of Arizona, Governor Brody, is going to deploy the Arizona Rangers. And on June 9th, just four days after this article is written, the strikers will be openly ignored and the Rangers will proceed to attack them. So the Rangers come in, threaten their workers, the strikers ignore the threats, and then 2,000 workers are going to mar march in solidarity in a downpour. But since the demonstrators had rifles, pistols, and knives, the presiding sheriff, Sheriff Park, appealed for more law enforcement backup. Now, there is no evidence that union leaders were actually going to use the weapons. They just carried them. And there's not, there's not even any reports the strikers ever fired a weapon. But more reinforcements are called in as law enforcement. The rainstorm continued, resulting in flooding and thunderstorms in the nearby mountains. Then, as according to the newspaper on your left, two torrents of water converged at the junction of Chase Creek and the San Francisco River forming a crest that ripped through the length of Clifton, destroying nearly $100,000 in property and accruing a death toll of 50 persons. Now, if you look on the paper, it says $50,000 and at least 30 people drowned. Later on, reports have increased up to 50 people dead $100,000 in property damage. The federal troops arrived, as well as six companies of the National Guard. By June 12th, they declared the community under martial law. But at this point, the strike has ended due to 50 people dying. But then after the strike, the workers were disarmed. Many were searched and arrested. The leaders were incarcerated in prison at Yuma. Thus, the company won. And despite the prognostications of the Brisbane Daily Review, the Arizona Mining Company continued to use Mexicano labor in what increasingly became defined as Mexican work. And again, these are both examples from the late 19th, early 20th century in the West that follow a similar pattern to what was going on back East with the Great Railroad Strike, the Pullman Strike, and the Homestead Strike. The government will, will intervene. This is not laissez-faire politics. This is not hands-off. The government will intervene, but they will only intervene on behalf of the rich white owners. And then when things do turn violent because they send in the military, they blame the strikers. So when I said at the beginning of this lecture, when I said that the government, the presidencies in this period were weak by design, that they were embracing free market laissez-faire capitalism, they only embraced small government when it came to helping the average everyday citizens. When it came to helping the wealthy Anglo business owners, oh, they were all up in there helping them. This was not only true in uh, mining, it was also true in both farming and ranching. Now, as we talked last time, here's one more image of the affair in the Mexican affair, as the paper called it, in Clifton. Okay, let me bring that back up real quick because apparently it declined. And so farming was another prominent occupation in the West. Now, the last time we talked about this, Anglos came in the Southwest and through questionable means, they would take the land that once belonged um, and guaranteed to the Mexican American population. Some of that land would become mining but other parts of that land would become both farms and ranches. Now, farming was difficult in the West. Now, whereas the Southeast was easy farming, 
California was pretty easy farming. Most of the West is very limited in fertile land. And it's quite different than it was back East. For instance, you could make good money with 100 acres back East in say the Southeast. But if you're in the Central Plains or toward the West, you need 500 acres, 1,000 acres to give you the same productivity as 100 acres back East. And the reality is, though irrigation is not the same, the fertile soil is not the same, and thus only the mega wealthy, the already rich, were able to purchase the equipment. Were able to redirect the rivers to irrigate their fields and then to hire workers to actually farm it. And so the reality is the West was largely unsuitable to farming, except by the very rich. And only the large wealthy landowners were able to really succeed. And in doing so, they would try to create and make this unsuitable land fertile. They would destroy the vegetation, which of course is going to cause a major ecological disaster to the 1930s. It was the same thing, not only for farming, but also for ranching. And again, ranching became big business, but very quickly, even though it, be, it, it became very quickly tied and concentrated in the hands of a few wealthy major ranchers, because cattle had to be driven from, say, Texas up into the Midwest, into places like Kansas and Missouri and Nebraska, and to be put on trains to be sent back east or west to sell the beef. It took a lot of money and resources to do this. And quite honestly, the land next to the railroads was expensive to wait for the trains to arrive. And so fun fact, it was actually vaqueros, Mexican or Tejano, Texas Mexican, Mexicano cowboys, vaqueros, who taught both Anglos and African Americans how to ranch and how to drive the herds north. And for a few short years in the post-Civil War era, there was some interracial cooperation and camaraderie. But once Anglos learned how to do it themselves, and once the rich, wealthy Anglos bought up all the land, once again, segregation took place and discrimination took place. And so despite the fact that the Homestead Act we talked about before was promising free land, the reality is land near those railroads you see on the screen was expensive. It wasn't free, it was $25 an acre. And $25 an acre is expensive. And so what this meant was small ranchers couldn't compete. These ranchers ended up working for larger ranchers. And many of the larger, largest ranching operations were massive in scale. And very similar to mining and agribusiness farming, we would see labor disputes between the ranchers and the large ranch companies that hired them. And of course, the most hurt group of people here are the Mexicanos, who've been using this land for generations. They're now being faced with new perils, new land loss. And now rich agribusiness and ranchers who are pushing them off their land once again. And one of the ways they were able to do this, though, was through new technology of the Gilded Age called barbed wire. Now, it might not seem like a big, massive thing, but barbed wire was instrumental to large farmers, this what I call agribusiness, because they were able to close off their property. And this prevented animals and cowboys from driving their herds across the country. And it took money to pay to these large agribusiness landowners to gain the rights to move the herds across their property, which once again, 
unless you were already wealthy, Anglo large landowners, you didn't get those rights. And thus barbed wire will help reshape the West during the period 1865 and 1900. The same thing will happen to places like New Mexico. Even though there's not a lot of farming there, ranches take center stage. And as the railroads come in, we start seeing new Mexican landowners undermined, especially that old idea of community land tenure. So remember, many Mexican families would often have communal land. These were land grants given by both the Spanish and Mexican governments, theoretically guaranteed by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. But once the railroad starts entering into New Mexico, they begin to take over this land from the Mexican and Mexicano people themselves. One of the biggest issues here was the railroad comes in to a place called Las Vegas, New Mexico. The, it was a Las Vegas land grant. Now this was communal owned land. There, here's a picture of it for you. The Las Vegas land grant was this huge land grant that was usually communal held land by Mexicanos. And big time Anglo landowners came in, began to farm and ranch the area. Then the railroad came in and began, all of them began to use barbed wire to partition off the land. In doing so, it steals land from Mexicanos. And it also denied Mexicanos access to things like wood, water, both for drinking and irrigation and also grazing land. So not only did they lose their communal land, they lost access to resources. And over the course of 18 months, the Mexicano heirs to the town of the Las Vegas land grant began to organize in opposition to the development and the enclosure of their lands caused by railroad and commercial speculation. So here's the deal. There's this Las Vegas land grant guaranteed to these Mexicanos. In comes the railroad, in comes the big businessmen who want to partition off this land and privatize it. For more than 18 months, Mexicanos fought against this. And one of the leaders of this was a, known as the Herrera brothers, Juan Jose Herrera and his younger brothers, Nincanor and Pablo. Now, these are the leader of this was Juan Jose. And he was the leader and organizer of this movement. And he himself was a member of the radical labor organization, the Knights of Labor. So remember, I told you the Knights of Labor spread across the country. And Juan Jose um, Herrera was a local organizer of the local chapter of the Knights of Labor in New Mexico. And by 1889, his local chapter of the Knights of Labor had more than 1,500 members. Now, what you see on your screen right now is a partial platform, what they stood for, what they demanded, and what their purpose was. So, Number one, their purpose is to protect the rights and interests of the people in general, especially those of the helpless classes. Again, this is very populist. This is very much in tune with the Knights of Labor. They also demanded that the Las Vegas land grant be settled to the benefit of all concerned. And that this we hold is the entire community. In other words, keep the communal land access. Number three, we want no land grabbers or obstructionists of any sort. In other words, these business speculators and land speculators coming from back east with the railroads are a problem. Number four, we're not really against lawyers in general, but we do feel the unfair treatment of the people must be stopped. We also favor irrigation enterprises, but will fight any scheme that prevents us, the people, from using it, from benefiting. 
And of course, they end with the term Las Corras Blancas, 1,500 strong and growing daily. And this organization they formed, again, they were a local chapter of the Knights of Labor, but locally they became known as Las Corras Blancas, the white caps, if you translate it. Now, let's be very clear for a minute here. Yes, they wear white caps to disguise their identities. Yes, they ride at night. But do not confuse them with the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. Okay? This is not the KKK. This is not a white supremacist organization. Las Gorras Blancas, the white caps, is an organization designed for Mexicanos to protest white speculators from coming in and taking their land or taking their usage of the land. Yes, they would ride at night wearing white caps and they would cut fences, they would burn crops, they would burn bars, and they would in general destroy some property. But let's be very clear also, Las Gorras Blancas generally avoided direct attacks on individuals. They did not usually, again, some rare instances aside, rare exceptions, they never directly attacked people, individuals. They instead attacked symbols of corruption and land dispossession. Like they would cut fences, burn down barns, undo dams that prevented water access. Now, there are a few cases, however, that would result in nearly resulting in physical harm, such as November 1889, the railroad agent at Roe, New Mexico, was determined to prevent destruction of rail property. So Las Gorras Blancas showed up to destroy the railroad property, and the railroad agent was determined to prevent the destruction. And when he confronted Las Gorras Blancas with a shotgun, the result was a brief gun battle that forced him to flee, quote unquote, into his house to save his life. Again, he didn't die, he was not harmed, but there was a direct confrontation. In another instance, Las Gorras Blancas did set the home of a surveyor and local militia captain on fire. So they went to the homes and they set them on fire. But all people escaped. Once again, no one actually died here but you wouldn't know it from the media coverage. Because in the media, they're portrayed as dangerous outlaws. Even Miguel Otero, again, provisional governor of New Mexico, would describe Las Gorras Blancas as a quote unquote, criminal organization who worried that it would set back relations with anger. Remember, he's very much a must be white person. But the thing is, what they really wanted was actually quite normal. What they wanted was a favorable decision regarding the Las Vegas land grant. They wanted to protect the community's right to use and occupy their historic land. It was only when legal action failed that Las Gorras Blancas would vow militant retribution. They would cut miles of fence lines, destroy buildings and farm equipment. And yes, they would even threaten the lives of some of the encroachers, some of whom were even fellow Mexicanos. Again, this was not a racist thing. This is an economic displacement thing. And so while some were against them, others would sympathize. In fact, in August of that same year, these white caps would destroy miles of fences and posts from the farm of the local county sheriff, Lorenzo Lopez. In response, though, the sheriff, much to the dismay of local businessmen, removed the remaining barbed wire in posts himself. So again, there were some who supported him. But in response to this violence, the governor, then governor in 1890, who was LeBaron Bradford Prince, 
pictured on the screen, denounce Las Gorras Blancas as a vigilante mob and begin to take measures to secure the safety of local officials. In October of 1890, a grand jury using flimsy evidence indicted 47 men, including the Herreras, on fence cutting charges. The newly installed local sheriff arrested 23 of them, including the Herrera brothers, and put them in jail awaiting trial. The sheriff feared escalating violence and telegraphed the governor asking for 50 rifles and ammunition. You know, the kind you keep for the militia. Because what he feared was more than a hundred mob, hundred person mob coming to attack. But despite these fears, no mob came, no violence ensued. Instead, all 23 men were bailed out, welcomed by the community, prompting an impromptu parade with the waving of U.S. flags as they sang an abolitionist and labor song, John Brown's Body, you see on the screen. You see, the strategies of Las Gorras Blancas were a fairly logical outgrowth of the larger mood of the country. So many workers and farmers felt as if the government was not meeting their needs. Though they were portrayed by the media and by whites as dangerous brigands, criminals as lawless, this was an outgrowth of the larger populist and labor movement of the era. However, the main thrust of Las Gorras Blancas would decline within a few years. Terence Powderly himself, leader of the Knights of Labor, became very concerned about the violence that surrounded Las Gorras Blancas especially with the leadership of Juan Jose Herrera. Local chapters of the Knights of Labor were concerned about what they described as, quote, a large number of Mexican people of the lower classes who are being admitted to their union, unquote. And what they feared is with these low classes of Mexicans that it would prompt and a backlash against the Knights of Labor Union, which ironically is what happened, not because of Mexicanos, but because of Chicago anarchists at the Haymarket Riot of 1886. But in addition to a loss of support from Knights of Labor, Las Gorras Blancas also lost support due to the economy. For instance, in March of 1890, 300 armed men destroyed 9,000 railroad ties in protest for wage increases. But rather than give a wage increase, the Santa Fe Railroad Company instead refused to buy any future railroad ties from San Miguel County where the violence took place. So pick this for a minute. They're protesting for a wage increase. During the protest, Las Gorras Blancas come in and destroy 9,000 railroad ties that are purchased from this area for the railroad. Rather than give a wage increase, the Santa Fe Railroad instead refuses to buy any more railroad ties from the um, San Miguel County production of railroad ties. This cost the county $100,000 a year in lost revenue and creates vast unemployment. You hit them in the pocketbooks. And this loses popular support for Las Gorras Blancas. They see the violence now as detrimental to the cause. And in addition, Terrence Powderly himself will cut all connection with Las Gorras Blancas leader, Juan Jose Herrera. But again, the takeaway here is these were not always successful. Most of them were not, but they weren't back east for Anglo workers either. In fact, it was a similar experience out west, just as it was back east. The power buttressed by the government 
was in the hands of the wealthy owners, whether it was mining, ranching, railroads, or farming. It's gonna take more time and a whole new era to really clean up this crap. But that's a topic for next time. So until then, take care and bye-bye.